Good morning, everybody. This is the audience participation part of the program. Can we do that one more time? Good morning, everybody. All right, there we go. It is my pleasure today to introduce to you um, somebody that I get to interview today, that we're going to learn a lot of really interesting things about the nature of security and how governments can respond and deal with security issues better. Our our guest today, Michael Chertoff, is co-founder and executive chairman of the Chertoff Group, a security and risk management firm where he provides high-level strategic counsel to corporate and government leaders on a broad range of security issues from risk identification and prevention, to preparedness, response, and recovery. As the second secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Chertoff strengthened our nation's borders, provided intelligence analysis and infrastructure protection, increased the department's focus on preparedness ahead of disasters, and implemented enhanced security at airports and borders. Prior to his nomination by President George W. Bush, Mr. Chertoff served as the federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Earlier, during more than a decade as a federal prosecutor, he investigated and prosecuted cases of political corruption, organized crime, corporate fraud, and terrorism, including the investigation of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Mr. Chertoff served as United States Attorney for the District of New Jersey from 1990 to 1994 and as Clerk to Supreme Court Justice Williams Brennan Jr. from 1979 to 1980. Please welcome to the stage Secretary Chertoff. Thank you. Awesome. Good to see you. Good to see you. So I figured we'd start off our conversation with, you know, a, a light and airy topic just to get us going. <laughs> okay, so good. what is the role of government in protecting our national cyber infrastructure? <clears throat> well, you know, if you go, first of all, it's great to be here. Great to see uh, all you bright and early here on what I think is going to be a beautiful day. Uh, if you go back even 20 years, you know, we principally relied on government to protect us against threats, national security threats, criminal threats. Um, and that was in a time when we had a perimeter. Uh, you knew, for example, that if a bomber or a missile was launched, uh, it was going to come in, it was going to be on the radar screen, you were going to shoot it down. In the modern cyber world, the kind of threats we face are within our own country and they're on our own networks. And that makes it much more challenging to rely on government because unless you want the government to operate everything on your network, you're going to have to take responsibility as the network operator yourself. So government can be a partner, can share information, can share intelligence, can share best practices, but government can't do the job for you. It, now, there's one, one exception. Um, there is an element to cybersecurity which we call deterrence. And that involves basically telling the adversary that there's going to be a consequence if they carry out an attack. Mm -hmm. When we deal with criminals, deterrence <clears throat> is about prosecuting them in the criminal justice system, which, of course, is the government's responsibility. When we deal with nation states, uh, deterrence may mean responding in some other way. And that is the one area where government really ought to have the exclusive responsibility to carry out deterrence. Well, I'm thinking in the context of proactive defense. I just want to push on that a little bit, right? I mean, the first, you know, U.S. Armed Force was the Department, was uh, you know, the Coast Guard, right. which was designed to, you know, protect our maritime fleet and to, you know, as you pointed out earlier, collect and levy taxes. Um, so it is a role of government to protect the basic sort of commercial infrastructure of a nation. So do we have a responsibility to help sort of secure things like Amazon in the same way that we, you know, protect kind of our nuclear infrastructure today? Well, the government clearly has a responsibility <clears throat> to work with the private sector to do it. But you just mentioned the Coast Guard. In the old days, there was a coast and the threat came across into the coast. So you could have a Coast Guard. These days, the threat could come with someone taking a thumb drive, walking into a Starbucks, loading, loading it into their laptop, and then sending it out over the network. There is no coast, and that's why this is a team sport and not something you can exclusively look to the government to do. How do we envision those sort of public partnerships working? Is it just about standards and regulation, or is there an active defense sort of posture that we can take as well? Well, we want to be careful with the phrase active defense, which I've discovered means a lot of different things to different people. Clearly, you want to have information sharing, and the government can provide and does provide platforms 
where the private sector can come together and share information about threats. Uh, we want to share information about tactics that can be used in best practices. All of that, I think, is uh, an important thing for government and the private sector to do together. Now, active defense, to some people, means hacking back. Uh, you've been attacked, you want to go and take the server that attacked you offline, or maybe recapture your stolen property. The problem with that is, uh, if you put that in private hands, you're creating kind of a free-for-all. And first of all, the private companies may be breaking the law. That's one issue. Second, uh, they may wind up uh, inadvertently harming an innocent third party with tremendous liability consequences. And third, they may wind up escalating a conflict to the point that we really get into a, a, a serious uh, battle. So I think that when it comes to what I call active defense, which is defending forward outside of your own network, that's an area where I think the government has to be the, the principal actor. Okay. What about establishing standards or guidelines or best practices or even, you know, so you have sort of passive active defense measures, yeah. such as even you could think about the Huawei situation as possibly being a passive active yeah. defense tactic. I think the government does have a role to play in, in helping to set standards and guidance because I know one of the challenges that companies face is knowing how, how much to invest, uh, what is the return on investment in security, uh, and how much is more than you need to do. Uh, we have some general standards, like NIST, for example, or ISO or general standards. Um, and uh, I think there are, for example, some areas where we may want to go a little further. We're about to enter the era of the Internet of Things. I mean, I guess we're in it already. Um, and that's going to be a proliferation of wirelessly connected, quote, smart devices, all of which provide an opportunity for an attacker to get into your network. The problem is many of these devices have almost zero security built into them by design. Um, they don't have passwords, or if they do, it's one, two, three, four. There's no provision for updating. There's no provision for patching. It may be this is an area where government ought to lay down uh, standards for what can be deployed or what can be uh, certified as secure Internet of Things devices so that when people buy them, they know whether something reaches at least a minimal level of security. It's a little bit like when you go to the supermarket, you're relying on the government to basically have standards that certify that, for the most part, the food is not tainted or going to make you ill. And we may need to have something like that in the IoT world. Well, and I'm thinking about even, so you, you talked about perimeter security, I'm thinking about looking at the wire, right? Because the way that you track security threats with IoT often is by looking at traffic or looking at sort of Correct. behavioral analysis. That's a task that if we leave that up to just private enterprise to do, becomes an onerous burden, almost like regulation at that, re at that level, that this becomes a barrier to being able to do business, it becomes a barrier to innovation. So I'm wondering if the government can help streamline that. Well, I mean, the government can, can do things to streamline the process, but in the end, uh, the monitoring of the network has to be the owner of the network's responsibility, unless you want to live in a world in which the government is constantly monitoring your network, and then you could move to China. They'll do that there for you. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we, if we still value our civil liberties and our, our privacy and our freedom, we want to make sure the government enables the private sector to do the job, but we don't necessarily want to have the government living on our networks. All right, that's fair enough. Let's segue a little bit, because we've been talking a lot about some fairly top-level, fairly high-level kind of strategic security and risk issues. A lot of the people in this room have to go and talk to boards. They've got to go and talk to CEOs. They've got to go and talk to their secretaries, their leadership, who, you know, quite frankly, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, would just as soon turn a blind eye to some of these things. I think many of these people just want to write a check and hope that they're, you know, that by paying some money that they're secure now. How should our leaders in the audience have that conversation with their leadership so that their CEOs, their boards, or their, you know, public sector leaders can really be aware of these risks and, you know, characterize these risks as board level issues so that it's something that they have to act upon? Well, that's a really important question. And, and <coughs> I, um, I'd say there are two dimensions to this. Uh, and I say this as someone who, you know, most of my day job is counseling boards and 
so-called C-suite on these issues. One is it, it becomes a problem when the board of the C-suite believes this is just a technical issue, so let's get an engineer to do it. And the reality is, as you know, it's policy and procedure and practices that really define what your cybersecurity is. The technical tools enable that, but the technical tools without the policy and procedures don't really do the job for you. The second problem is there are so many solutions out there that are being tossed at people and companies that you could bankrupt yourself if you buy all the tools. And that causes a lot of executives to say, look, I, I, I can't possibly afford all this. I don't know what to do. I feel powerless, so I'm just gonna hope I feel I get lucky and nobody attacks me. To me, what you have to do is you have to explain clearly how to manage expectations mm -hmm. with respect to security to the people who run the company. So to me, I, and this, that involves the following propositions. First, you've got to disabuse people of the idea that there is a solution that will prevent you from ever getting breached or, or attacked. It does not exist, it will never exist. It would be like going to your doctor and saying, doctor, I never want to be sick again. The doctor would laugh at you when he throw you out of the office. So in cyber, what I tell boards is it's like the human body. Yes, you want to have a good perimeter defense, you want to try to reduce the number of penetrations, but accept the fact you will get sick. And just like your body has an immune system, getting sick in a way, if you have a resilient system, makes you stronger. The viruses and the bacteria get in your body, your immune system fights them off, kills them, and then the next time you have an immunity. You want to build a security system in your network <clears throat> that allows you to detect when there has been a penetration, reduces the consequences, characterizes and identifies the nature of the attacker, and then makes you immune the next time. So it is about defense in depth and an architecture that allows you not to eliminate the risk, because you can't eliminate risk in life, but allows you to reduce the risk. And I find that by putting it in those terms, people, first of all, feel empowered. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, I can do this because I'm not trying to achieve the impossible. And second, they come to understand that more important than the technical issues are the issues of how do I architect my business, what are my key assets, and what are the policies and procedures affecting the people that I have to put in place, and then the technology allows me to implement those policies. So I love the metaphor that you use there about the body and about sort of medicine, because that is sort of very much the situation we're in. There is no recipe for never getting sick again, except for there kind of is, right, which is preventative medicine. Correct. Which we still have great difficulty getting right. regular people to do. Right, exactly. Right? Getting them to go to the doctor, getting them to get their, you know, prostate exams or whatever, you'll forgive that. We have to do, yeah. you know, some potty humor at some point in time in a keynote presentation. But um, <clears throat> how do we create, because when you're not being attacked, when you're being attacked, a yeah. response is easy. Because then we go on the offense and we're wired to deal with the offense. But yeah. those sort of active defense measures, that sort of preventative health, as it were, how do we create the urgency for boards to address that when they're not being attacked? Well, and I think, and first of all, I agree with you. I mean, I think part of what you experience with your human body is that you get, you get immunized, and that's actually a kind of information sharing about the signature of harmful uh, attackers, and that's the same thing you try to do in, in cyber. Look, I understand there's a tendency only to look at the issue that confronts you in the immediate future. If you look at what has gone on in the world literally every day, um, it's hard for me to believe a board doesn't understand that this is becoming an existential threat. If you're Maersk, for example, uh, uh, in the last couple of years, you had the Not Pet Your Ransomware, which basically was launched by the Russians. Uh, it was aimed at the Ukraine. It infected some common accounting software with ransomware. And among other things, Maersk, because it had an office in Kyiv, uh, wound up getting infected and they lost tens of millions of dollars because they couldn't access their business systems. You see this all the time. You see massive thefts of personal data. There is liability involved with this. There is um, risk to business processes and business reputation. So I think boards are more and more getting this. Mm -hmm. But again, the challenge is to empower them 
with a pathway to a solution rather than here are a hundred things you can buy and stick on your network. Well, I wonder if we couldn't even deal, deal with or do with some basic guidance, right? We know, again, sticking with the human you know, medical kind of metaphor, we know that if you're a man over 45 years old, you need to get certain exams periodically. That if you're you know, a woman over certain ages, you need to get you know, breast exams periodically. <clears throat> We need, do we have that sort of guidance and can we rely upon the government to give well, us some of that sort of preventative care and maintenance guidance? The, you know, the government will tell you you ought to do things like periodically red team or test or do exercises, but the government's not going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that many of the companies that we deal with in my, in, in my practice do now understand the importance of red teaming on your vulnerabilities or having exercises. I'll give you two concrete examples. Um, we were, did work with a company I won't ma mention, um, and they asked us to kind of red team, and they had a very good network security system. So we had people go into the lobby of the building, and they claimed to have a bogus appointment. They had a bogus appointment with an executive. They were told by the receptionist to wait there. They, as typically people do when they're waiting, they open up the laptop. What the reception didn't receptionist didn't know is that the team basically was able to log onto the unprotected Wi-Fi in the building and suck out a ton of data because they were in the physical perimeter and were able to connect up with an unpassword protected Wi-Fi. That's an example of something that was an aha moment for the company. Um, the other thing is we ran an exercise I did myself with a, a global bank and the scenario we had was, what happens if the vendor that deals with identification for bank cards and for your logging onto accounts gets compromised and all that identification winds up getting stolen by criminals? And the bank's first reaction was, we better shut down because we're not gonna know until we sort out a new form of identification whether people logging on are legitimate or not. But as we worked through the exercise, I suggested to them, you know, there are patterns of transactions that your customers do on a regular basis that are intrinsically self-validating. So if someone, for example, does payroll every two weeks and money is sent to certain destinations, and in two weeks that same instruction comes in, you can probably rely on that, even if you're not 100% sure about whether the identification credentials were compromised. So that got them thinking about other things they could build to give them resiliency or fallback positions in the case of a compromise. And that's the value of these things. It's in thinking through and building the capabilities you need to protect yourself and to be resilient before the event happens. Well, and it's understanding the behaviors, right? Correct. And understanding what threatening behavior and non-threatening behavior looks like. I was just, anecdotally, I, I've had my American Express card stolen like four Correct. times over the past year. And the last time, American Express said, don't update your account numbers on any of your websites. Your Amazon, anything you order on Amazon, on your old number, we'll just know. Anything, we know your Netflix, we know you're this, we know you're that. They were trying to use behavioral analysis to figure out which one of the websites that I do business with on a fairly regular basis basis was letting my credit card get out of yeah, that's a Yeah, great, that's a great point because uh, in the end, the real key to security and, and the evolution of security now is moving more and more to behavioral analytics. Mm -hmm. And even in the network, uh, there are now tools that you can deploy in the network that will monitor for anomalous behavior. It used to be that it was all rule-based. There'd be a set of rules you had to program into the analytics, and if someone broke the rule, that's what the red flag was. But now it's gotten sophisticated enough that the analytics and the machine learning detects people's normal pattern of behavior. Everything from how they log on, how long it takes them, where they go first. And when they detect something that disrupts the pattern, they raise a red flag so you can investigate further. So behavior really is more and more at the heart mm -hmm. of security. And it can even be small behaviors. I remember ages ago, my dad worked at Bell Labs, and he was talking about a system that they were working on that was timing the time between keystrokes to enter yeah. your password. Because it wasn't your password that was getting you into the system. It was your ability to type a particular phrase using the same sort of yeah. keys. And someday we're going to move to a system where multi-factor authentication is going to be not just your biometric and a password, which we all know is inherently weak, but will involve 
uh, where you are, uh, your keystrokes, um, all kinds of things that are very subtle physical and mental cues that the machine can pick up. Well, and this is, you know, even when we get into the topic of identity, right? I mean, I, I think about, you know, Apple's recent announcement about how they're going to enable sign-on for, you know, any website or any service that wants, you know, by using the phone, which I think is a remarkably good idea because one of the things that we don't have in this wild, wild west of sort of internet commerce is identity. Yeah. We don't have a certified or a non-repudiatable source of identification, which is really, really challenging, particularly when we're trying to track bad actors. Correct, and identity really <clears throat> is, is a foundational element of security because that is literally the key that allows you to determine what access you're entitled to have, what privileges you have, where you're entitled to go. And so robust and secure identity becomes really both the Achilles heel but also the, the real strength of a security system. Are you aware of any kind of efforts within the government to create sort of a digital identity or digital identity capability? Well, the U.S., I mean, they have these CAC cards, if you're in right. the government or the military, that are a secure form of identification. Uh, you know, we've moved to, obviously, more secure passports. Uh, there's global entry, which you can use, which is fingerprint-based, although now, when I was recently flew into Miami from overseas, uh, it's actually facial recognition, mm -hmm. which was interesting and worked very well. Um, and in the end, I think you want multiple factor authentication. But what I don't think the government's going to do is create a general identification for all purposes because Americans usually are allergic to the idea of having government ID for everything you do. It's one thing to do it getting on a plane or crossing a border. It's another thing to have to do it to, you know, just do an ordinary transaction. Oh, fair enough. Let's kind of segue to pr privacy a little bit. Kind of back to sort of the board level and some of these other things. One of the ways, or it seems like rather, one of the ways that we have to get our boards or our stakeholders sort of attention is when regulations come down. So I'm thinking about you know, GDPR and some of those other sorts of things. What do we feel like about you know, kind of the privacy infrastructure of the United States and um, our reaction to those regulations? Is it not 10 years too late on this? I mean, we've already created an economic model of monetizing people's data pipelines. Is, is privacy just not a thing anymore? Is this so, too much too yeah. late? So, Lee, I mean, I, I've written a book about this, which mm -hmm. came out uh, last year. It just came out in paperback. It's called Exploding Data. And the reason I wrote the book was to make the point that, um, or this came right after the Snowden stuff, um, I wanted to point out that um, what the government was actually collecting and using was far less than what the private sector was collecting and using. And as you point out, Lee, the idea that you can protect your privacy by keeping things secret has become really an illusion because it's not just what you deliberately put online, but you, what you unwittingly put online and what others put online about you. And uh, this is not kept in separate silos. It is all aggregated. Sometimes it's sold. And therefore, it's quite possible to have a granular view of everything you do, what you eat, how you sleep, where you go, how you drive, in the hands of an insurance company or an employer that will literally mean that every decision you make, you have to ask yourself, am I going to get rewarded or punished for this? Uh, insurance companies now, for example, want you to share health data, including your Fitbit, you know, what you eat, they can maybe get your uh, loyalty card, supermarket card, uh, they can get your credit card data, and they can see whether you are living a healthy lifestyle, and then your rates go up and down depending on whether they approve of your lifestyle. It could affect whether you get employed or not. And if you think about it, that could easily get us to the point that every decision you make, you have to ask yourself, uh, what, what is the consequence of this going to be? And that is a surveillance state that makes George Orwell's 1984 look like a kindergarten. We call that Panopticon 4, Correct. by the way. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, That's absolutely. exactly right. So I think one of the solutions which the Europeans have come up with, which I think we're starting to see now in a number of states in the U.S., is to recognize the focus has to change from trying to hide your data, which ain't going to happen, into giving you the legal right to control your data even after it's been collected. So under GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, you have a right to know who has the data about you, uh, and if they want to use it for a different purpose, they have to explicitly ask you for permission. And we're going to get that in the U.S. too. 
Um, and I think um, it is a, somewhat late because there are companies that have built a business model out of making you the product and your data. Well, the entire business model of the internet is based on monetizing those data pipelines. We had a chance to talk yeah. with uh, the guys over at Alibaba. They told us, this is their words, that they can draw a two-mile circle or two-mile perimeter around any individual within their market areas in China and tell you everything that that person has done within that two-mile radius, right. and everything that they're likely to do. They have, just for you guys' as reference, for your own enterprises, they have over 200 companies. They have a single customer master with over 20,000 data points on it. Now that's, you raise, Alibaba which raises another interesting point from a national security standpoint. And I was asked this when I was overseas by, by some uh, senior officials in, in Europe and, and Asia. What happens when a company like Alibaba or, or another Chinese company collects huge amounts of data on Americans? Are they gonna be transporting it back to Beijing? As you know, Beijing, uh, there's a law in China that allows the government to look at any data it wants to look at, and they've openly avowed their intention to build artificial intelligence leadership into the next decade. So if They outpublish publish us on AI by about correct, 10 to 1 right correct. now, today. So if you bring all that U.S. person's data to China, does that mean the Chinese will build, this is a rhetorical question, a giant database about Americans, where they know everything individual Americans do, health, relationships, it's all fed into artificial intelligence, and it becomes a powerful tool for intelligence, for disinformation campaigns, for um, uh, propaganda, and for counterintelligence. So, I mean, I think data is now becoming a significant feature of our national security set of strategies. So we were talking earlier about the, the, the social credit score in China and some of those aspects as well. And I know that seems sort of creepy to some people, but pushing on some of that. I mean, we have a de facto social credit score in America. It's just your credit score, though. But that determines whether I can get an apartment, whether I can get a job, whether I can get into graduate school, all these other things. I mean, is not maybe richer data better? In well, I mean, and I'm, I'm just pushing on you. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not actually arguing the position. I mean, the question is, is Data for what purpose? I mean, the credit score is still basically meant to assess your financial uh, um, position and whether you're financially reliable. But now let's take the issue of your health. There's apparently now an app that is available to employers called Ovia. <clears throat> and this is, is an app which the employer can make available to female employees who either want to conceive a child or are pregnant in order to monitor all of their vital signs and health behavior and eating and everything to determine if this is gonna promote a successful pregnancy. Now, this is supposed to be anonymous, but you all know that when you have a relatively small number of employees, it's an illusion to believe it's gonna be really anonymous. So I'm saying to myself, seriously, you wanna have your <laughs> employer, if you're a, a, a pregnant female or want to conceive, you want your employer to know everything about your pregnancy. So we are developing a much wider database. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need to, again, think carefully about <clears throat> what control you have and what freedom you have in terms of sharing that data. Now, maybe one of the answers is this, and I've said this, suggested this in, in my book, that when you are dealing with a service online, that is effectively a monopoly because of the network effect, you should be obliged to offer customers a choice. They can either allow you to use the data as a, as, and then get the service for, quote, free, although it's not really free, or they can say, no, you can't use my data for other purposes, but I'm willing to pay a cash subscription fee for the service. It's fair to allow the service provider to be uh, rewarded, but I'm not sure the only choice ought to be to reward them with your data as opposed to your money. Well, and that's the trick, right, is that we have an internet infrastructure and an e-commerce infrastructure that's based on monetizing data where nobody really knows right. what's happening, nobody understands how this data is being used, and it can be very easily misused. And I think Americans have got sort of a natural integrated suspicion about some of these things. Like you brought up that great example about the OVA map and being able to track people's uh, pregnancy. My, 
biggest concern would be, and, and I think, you know, you and I are probably uh, on the same page when it comes to, you know, expanding the role of government in some of these roles. I'm not big into, you know, great government control either, but the wild, wild west nature of the way that we do things today makes us really vulnerable because we don't have a unified kind of protection mechanism. We don't have a unified way of dealing with some of these things. I, I just, that is one of my concerns. I don't know if, 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 if you share the same concern and if you have any insight well, I about do, that. I do think, I mean, I do think on this GDPR issue, even, even some of the social media platforms have now acknowledged that there probably needs to be some government regulation in terms of the way data can be transferred and sold for two reasons. A, it levels the playing field. And B, at some point you run the risk, and I think some of the platforms are discovering this, that if people get very suspicious about the way their data is being used, they may start to walk away from some of these platforms. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think you see a number of these companies scrambling to get better control over what happens with their data. I mean, the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal where Facebook data wound up being transferred to a researcher who then, un apparently unknown to the company, gave it to uh, a targeting group at Cambridge Analytica that could use it to target political manipulation. I think that was a real wake-up call, and I think that that caused the companies to realize if there's not some baseline level of security, it's going to damage the whole business. Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit earlier as well about sort of cyber warfare and, you know, that's got sort of a glamorous kind of veneer over it and we, we believe that that's sort of casualty free and those sorts of things. But um, what's the wildest, you know, sort of risk scenario or tabletop scenario that you've run across when people were wargaming some of these? Uh... You know, I, unfortunately, it's not that wild. I mean, I think what we really worry about is a destructive attack that would actually have an effect on on human life and a substantial effect on the economy and property. If you go to the U Ukraine, they have the unfortunate distinction of being the test bed for Russia's uh, cyber tactics. Uh, two years in a row, Christmas time, significant parts of the Ukraine have gone dark for a few days because there were cyber attacks on the uh, infrastructure of the utilities there. The, the Department of Homeland Security has said publicly that they found Russian malware in some of our electric grids. Imagine you take out an electric grid. There was a, a steel furnace in Germany that was hacked and attacked, and basically it practically blew up because the control system was disabled. Imagine something where a con significant control system is disabled, and you could have effectively a kinetic effect and then wind up getting into a, into a war. So I do think that um, increasingly, not only is cyber warfare viewed as a domain of warfare, but the line between cyber and kinetic uh, at the high end could wind up evaporating. And a, an example recently is in the ongoing back and forth <coughs> between the Palestinians in Gaza and the Israelis, there was a cyber attack launched from Gaza, and apparently the Israelis responded by blowing up the building the cyber attack was launched from. So we have to be very mindful of the steps that might escalate what appears to be a, an online-only conflict into a no-holds-barred conflict. Well, we talked about that a little bit earlier as well, that, that um, there's a ladder or sort of an escalation yeah. ladder of engagement that if it's not explicitly defined by the rules of sort of warfare is implicitly understood by the diplomatic and sort of political community yeah. around the world. That, you know, if somebody, you know, blows up something at an airport, we don't go ahead and nuke that nation, right? That there's proportional responses. Or you take like the, the, uh, the mining of the Straits of Hormuz or something yeah. of that ilk. We don't go ahead and just invade somebody as a result of doing that. Yeah, but we don't not. have, hopefully we don't. Um, but uh, there's the lack of that in the cyber world, I think right? I think the escalation ladder in cyber is still in the process of being developed. I mean, I think it's, there's been a lot of attention paid to this in the last several years, have been thought about a lot. Um, you know, it took us a decade uh, after the nuclear bombs became available, not just to us, but to the Russians, to actually develop a full doctrine about escalation. Uh, and the key is you want to be able to respond in a way that sends a powerful message, but not in a way that slides you into maybe something getting out of hand. So one example in the, in the nuclear era is uh, there was kind of a tacit understanding that you don't respond to a conventional attack 
with a nuclear response. It's never been 100% sure, but essentially if you look at the actual practice, in no conflict the US or Russia have been involved in since 1950 has one side or the other used a nuclear weapon, uh, uh, even if there was, it got a little bit close sometimes. Um, and that was because of a sense that if you cross that threshold, it would be very difficult to know where to stop. And the, I know there are people who talk about tactical nuclear weapons. I'm not sure anybody really believes that you can define tactical and strategic uh, very clearly. We don't have that clarity in cyber yet, and I think this is an area where now, I do think there's some serious thought being given this DOD and other, um, you know, part of the security community, but we also need to understand how our adversaries are thinking. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is, although we've had some nuclear proliferation, there's a hell of a lot of proliferation of cyber attack tools. So you're trying to come up with a doctrine of escalation where there are many, many more actors involved, including some like Iran and North Korea that are not operating out of the same worldview that we are. Well, that brings us to rules of engagement, right? The, the real question about rules of engagement, what do we do with these tools? We have nation states creating hacking tools that in a few short months or in a few short years at the absolute longest wind up in the hands of teenagers. We would never allow the ability for regular people to be able to print their own viruses or whatever, but, or, or make their own IEDs or make their own sort of laser-guided bombs or what have you. So we keep these weapons intentionally out of the hands of people, but weaponizing AI, weaponizing some of these tools, or even you know, taking tools that were intentionally created as weapons and repurposing them in the hands of civilians is a real concern. Yeah. Now, this is a big issue, and I think that I'm, I'm on this, I'm co-chairing something called the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace, uh, which just actually just met in the, in the Netherlands a couple days ago. It's trying to look at some of these global issues about international law and the norms that apply in, in cyber. And um, I think a couple that you're raising which are worth looking at are how do we deal with the fact that there's a marketplace for these tools. If you go into the dark web, which to be honest is most of the internet, not the stuff that everybody <laughs> thinks about, uh, there are marketplaces that sell all kinds of tools uh, including destructive tools, and they can be used by ter terrorist groups or criminal groups. The other challenge is when we do create an exploit, the government does, to, to carry out an attack for a legitimate purpose, how do we prevent it from being captured by the um, adversary and then repurposed against us? And we've seen that from time to time. And it may be that uh, what ought to become part of the norm that we obey when we act as nation states as that we design code in exploits or weapons that make it a one-time only proposition that's self-destructive to use it once so that you can't repurpose it in much the same way as we have rules about how we work on experiment with biological agents to make sure they don't get out of the lab. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of serious questions about the design and the use of some of these offensive tools, which again need to be taken into the cyber age if we're not to widely distribute some very dangerous capabilities. Well, I'm curious if we don't need, just given the fact that our adversaries have got very, very, very close public-private relationships between their nation states and the companies that support them to the degree that the public state often directs, yeah. and I'm not going to name any countries out there because that's not my job, but, that, but to the degree that the state often directs private enterprise what to do. I wonder if there isn't an American solution to that sort of a problem, that a combination of some of our telcos, the government, and some of our critical you know, commerce infrastructure don't get together and create a collective or a consortium of some sort that helps tackle these issues. Because you, you talked a little bit back in the green room about even intelligence sharing. We yeah. can find vulnerabilities, and then there's reticence to share that even with some of the providers of some yeah. of our critical infrastructure for sources and methods. And I think that, you know, one of the issues is sometimes, uh, I, I think we overly uh, protect uh, some classified information from our private sector partners because I do think sometimes, um, you know, they, they pass background checks. There's a question of whether they need to know it, but the reality is if you don't share, uh, then it's useless because the private sector can't make, make use out of it. So I do think there's some more sharing. An area where you're beginning to see a little bit of partnership is the 5G area. 
That's exactly where I was going to segue to. And, and the, you know, the question now is we're about to go to a dramatic change in the infrastructure that relates to all of our wireless online activity, which is 5G. And uh, I was at a program uh, about a week ago in, in Europe with AT&T being present, and they were making it very clear, 5G is not, as you know, 4G, you know, kind of taking up a level. It's hugely different. And also, some of the dis distinction between the core and the periphery doesn't really make sense. So right now, Huawei, partly because I think they get a little bit of help from the Chinese government, and I put little, a little. quotes, <laughs> is selling uh, very inexpensive, and to be honest, quite high quality 5G infrastructure equipment around the world. The challenge, and I think the US government has said this publicly, is that whoever controls that equipment and sets the standards and provides the hardware and software is gonna wind up being in the pivotal position in terms of managing what goes on over that 5G network going forward. And whether that means uh, obtaining data that crosses the network or even potentially dialing up or dialing down the efficiency of the network as a way of gaining leverage if you're in a geopolitical dispute, the serious issue is do you want to have the U.S. and our allies dependent on Chinese goodwill in terms of the f most, perhaps most important foundational element of the next uh, 10 years of our, of our global economy? The U.S. for quite a while has made it very clear to the government, working with the telcos, you don't want to put uh, Huawei equipment at the core of your, of your network. Uh, I think now we're broadening that out and we're now in a dialogue with the Europeans and other allies about what they're going to do. One of the things that probably needs to happen, though, is we don't really have an equipment industry in the U.S. anymore. It's been largely acquired or taken over um, overseas. Um, some of it's, I think, Nokia bought Lucent eventually after Alcatel bought it. Uh, we have Ericsson. But it might make sense for us, to, again, to invest or create incentives on a national level in promoting the development of core infrastructure and equipment that we need in the next 10 or 20 years, whether it's secure chip foundries, secure 5G equipment. I mean, this is the building blocks. And, and, and much as we want to maintain, maintain our defense industrial base, maybe we need a cybersecurity industrial base that we need to strategically foster. That is an outstanding point to end our conversation on as well there, Secretary Chertoff. I just wanted to thank you for, for myself and from Gartner for coming out here and having a chat with us this morning. It was absolutely amazing okay. to get to meet you and to talk to you backstage and talk to you up here as well. And just thank you very much. It's just everybody, My let's pleasure. give, uh, thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so very much. Thank All right, thank you. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. That's awesome.